Hi, and welcome to the Breastfeeding Medicine Podcast. I'm your co-host, Dr. Ann Eglash. I'm a clinical professor in the Department of Family Medicine at the University of Wisconsin School of Medicine and Public Health and a board-certified lactation consultant. This podcast is produced and edited by The Milk Mob and is co-sponsored by the Academy of Breastfeeding Medicine. Are you ready to go? Hi everyone, this is Ann Eglash here with the February 2018 Breastfeeding Medicine Podcast. And for those of you who would like to follow this podcast on the web, um, you can see this at the Milk Mob channel on YouTube where there are slides and you can also see the articles um, that I'm speaking about. Otherwise, you should be perfectly fine just listening to this on audio. The first article I'm going to talk about is entitled Unilateral Ectopic Breast Tissue on Vulva. And this was an article that was published, actually a case report published in the journal Medicine just this year by Baradwin and Alwadi. The authors point out that ectopic mammary gland tissue will occur in about 2 to 5% of women in the general population. And this ectopic mammary gland tissue starts in the embryonic ridge that develops during fetalhood, and that extends from the axilla to the inguinal region. And as soon as that develops in the fetus, it will then re recede or disappear, although for some people they continue to have ectopic mammary tissue somewhere in that upper ridge, which would be in the upper chest down to maybe the, the upper abdomen. This was a case of a 27-year-old woman who had a vulvar mass during her pregnancy, and it gradually grew during pregnancy, so she eventually had it removed, and they found on biopsy that it was actually it was ectopic mammary gland tissue. So the bottom line for this report, which is very short, is just to think about ectopic mammary tissue in a growing mass in a woman who's pregnant, particularly if it seems to be along what would be called the milk line or the embryonic ridge. The next article is entitled Daytime versus Nighttime Caesarean Birth and Delay in Lactation. This is an article that was published this year in the Journal of OB and GYN Research by the authors Lehan, Armatka, and Kuman and others. And so the question in this article is whether interruption of the circadian rhythm plays a role in delay in lactation. And they define a delay in lactation as the milk coming in after, 70, after 72 hours. They state that the rate of delay of lactation ranges, according to various studies, anywhere from 17 to 44 percent. And from those of you, for those of you who are listening, you know that there are various factors that we associate with delay in lactation, such as preeclampsia, being a first-time mother, morbid obesity, type 2 diabetes or gestational diabetes, etc. We also know that delay of lactation is higher in women who undergo cesarean birth. In addition, we know that a delay in breastfeeding after the first hour is associated with a delay in lactation. So the question is, is the delay in lactation associated with cesarean birth related to delay in that first feeding? This study was done in Turkey among 288 mothers who underwent a cesarean birth. All of the mothers initiated breastfeeding all of them were over 18, and none of the mothers had any significant illnesses or complications that would typically be associated with a delay in lactation. All the newborns roomed in, and they all began breastfeeding within one hour postpartum, or at least they were um, offered to breastfeed at that point. They all received breastfeeding support postpartum, and they were allocated between daytime and nighttime feedings as the first feeding. And interestingly, in this population, some mothers will undergo an elective cesarean in the middle of the night. They collected demographic data to compare the two groups for things like age, body mass index, gestational week, gravida and parity, breastfeeding history, and the type of anesthesia that was used, um, either local or uh, general, um, epidural versus general. The authors found that there was no difference in demographic data between the daytime and nighttime cesarean groups. So in general, about 75% of these women were multiparous and about 25% were primips. 
and they describe the onset of stage two lactogenesis as the first time that the mothers felt that their milk was dripping or they heard swallows or they felt a tingling sensation. What they found is that there was no difference in the timing as to when these women in initiated breastfeeding. And so mo at least half the women initiated breastfeeding within the first hour, but overall the timing didn't differ between whether the baby was um, uh, born in the middle of the night or born during the day. However, they did notice a difference in stage two lactogenesis time. They found that there was a significant difference in when women first felt their milk coming in. Now, none of the women had a delay past 72 hours. And in fact, most described their onset of lactation within a couple hours. But there was at least uh, a four hour difference between those who had a daytime delivery and those who had a nighttime delivery. The authors describe possible reasons for the differences in when the milk comes in for daytime versus nighttime cesarean births. And they describe the possibility that coronal disruptors are causing sufficient hormonal and metabolic alterations to explain this difference. And a couple of these chronal disruptors would include the exposure to light, eating in the middle of the night, and sleep disturbances. They didn't actually measure any hormones to support this hypothesis, but they they generally recommend that women who are undergoing an elective cesarean, that they consider having that done during the day and not in the middle of the night. Another interesting observation is that mothers who had an emergency cesarean took longer for the milk to come in than mothers with an elective cesarean, which makes sense, I think, um, based on the fact that we know that women who have emergent cesarean births have more stress, and this may have an impact on when the milk comes in. The next article we're going to discuss is a review article about carotenoids during lactation. This was published in the journal Nutrients in 2017 with the authors Zelinska and Wasilowska. Dietary carotenoids exist in both maternal serum and in breast milk, and most of the dietary carotenoids come from fruits and vegetables. The most common ones include beta carotene, alpha carotene, lycopene, beta-cryptoxanthine, lutein, and zeaxanthine. The authors describe the role of carotenoids in their article, and they discuss that carotenoids are considered antioxidants, they're anti-inflammatory, and they're also immunomodulatory. Some of the carotenoids are converted to vitamin A, so they're actually considered pro-vitamin A nutrients. And carotenoids are found to decrease the risk of cancers, cardiovascular disease, eye disorders, and age-related cognitive decline. So the old adage of eating carrots every day to prevent um, blindness or to sharpen your vision is not very far-fetched. Carotenoids do end up in breast milk. And in fact, there's higher carotenoid levels in the fat portions of the milk. So we're more likely to see more carotenoids in hind milk as opposed to fore milk. In addition, even though colostrum is not high in fat, there are high carotenoid concentrations in colostrum, which is why it looks so yellow. We know that the amount of carotenoids in breast milk is based on the maternal dietary habits. So there are more carotenoids in breast milk if mom eats more fruits and vegetables, particularly those that are yellow and green and orange in color. Um, Formula-fed babies actually have very low or nearly undetectable levels of carotenoids because carotenoids have not really been added to formula. Researchers are now trying to understand the health benefits of carotenoids for breastfeeding babies. So we know that carotenoids are preferentially taken up by eye tissue, particularly some of them, such as lutein, zeaxanthine, and mesozeaxanthine. There's also this... Um, concept of the higher macular pigment ocular density. So we'll call the macular pigment ocular density MPOD for the ease of discussing this. The MPOD density correlates with higher carotenoid intake and the higher the MPOD, the decreased risk of age-related macular degeneration. 
Breastfed infants have higher MPOD than formula fed babies, and this seems to correlate with higher MPOD in adulthood. So that accumulation of carotenoids during infancy seems to play a role with the higher MPOD level in adulthood, and having a higher MPOD level in adulthood seems to protect from macular degeneration and other eye disorders. Based on some early evidence, the authors suggest that carotenoids might protect premature infants from oxidative stress, which would mean that they might protect against diseases such as retinopathy of prematurity, necrotizing enterocolitis, and bronchopulmonary dysplasia, since these illnesses are related to excessive oxidative stress. There's also evidence that pasteurized donor human milk doesn't have as many carotenoids or as many antioxidants because of the pasteurization process, but there's still more antioxidants in pasteurized donor human milk than there is in formula. And I think some research that we are hopefully going to see in the future is the role of carotenoids in brain development. Um, it seems that carotenoids do play an important role in nervous tissue development, but we don't have the data yet to to be certain in, to show that carotenoids play a role in the higher IQs that we see in breastfed children versus um, children who are not breastfed. The last article I want to briefly talk about today in this podcast is about inflammatory bowel disease and breastfeeding. And this information is coming from an article that's entitled Inflammatory Bowel Diseases, Review of Known Environmental Protective and Risk Factors Involved. And this was published in a journal called the Inflammatory Bowel Disease Journal in September of 2017 with the authors Van der Sloot and Amini. The authors first describe some demographics regarding inflammatory bowel disease, and they state that, first of all, we're talking about ulcerative colitis and Crohn's disease as major inflammatory bowel disease pathologies. And the highest rates tend to be in industrialized countries. And there's kind of a complex etiology associated with the development of these diseases. First of all, genetics probably is the major determinant. So you take someone who is quite at risk genetically because it runs in their family, the other factors increase or decrease the risk. So other factors would be the microbiome and then environmental influences. And they use the term exposome as a term that is the collective environmental um, exposure that an individual has. So the a childhood exposome or number of exposures is more likely to alter the immunological development of that child, which would play a role in the development of inflammatory bowel disease, whereas an adult who already has one's immune system already existing the exposome is going to modify the existing immune system as opposed to altering the immune system development, like what happens with a child. The most important childhood exposures that influence the development of inflammatory bowel disease are breastfeeding, which protects from, from inflammatory bowel, use of antibiotics, which increases the risk, and the use of antibiotics is particularly uh, more, more highly associated with inflammatory bowel disease if the exposure is under a year of age. Childhood hygiene with greater hygiene increasing the risk of disease and the um, experience of Helicobacter pylori infections actually protects from the development of inflammatory bowel disease. There was a meta-analysis back in 2004 that demonstrated how breastfeeding protects from inflammatory bowel disease. And this was a meta-analysis that was of 17 studies. And they found in general that there's a 1.8 times decreased risk of, for ulcerative colitis by breastfeeding and a 2.2 times decreased risk for Crohn's disease. Although many of these studies were unlike the others, so it was a rather heterogeneous group of studies, and there wasn't really a recommendation in the meta-analysis regarding the duration of time that's important for this influence to occur. But the authors in this paper suggest that the possible reasons for the protective effect of breastfeeding include, first of all, the induction of immune tolerance to certain food antigens that are in breast milk and the uh, microbiota that are in the gut. 
that maternal antibody um, antibodies that are passed through breast milk may have may play, play a, a sufficient role in the development of the immune system that it helps to reduce the risk of development of inflammatory bowel disease, and that the difference in the gut flora between a breastfed baby and a formula-fed baby plays a role with, of course, the microbiome of the breastfed infant being protective. This slide, for those of you who can see it, has a chart on the influences of Crohn's disease versus ulcerative colitis. And on the top portion of the slide, you can see that uh, the first several factors have to do with childhood exposures. So for Crohn's disease, the number one uh, factor that's associated with a decreased risk of Crohn's disease is sharing a bedroom as a child. Breastfeeding comes next. And then the third major protective factor is Helicobacter pylori infection. Factors that increase the risk of Crohn's disease for children would be urban living environment, use of antibiotics between ages 5 to 16, and the highest risk factors are hot water tap available and the use of antibiotics under age 1. And the hot water availability has to do with improved hygiene. For ulcerative colitis, the childhood exposures are slightly different. Sharing a bedroom is important, is the number one most important factor in preventing ulcerative colitis. Breastfeeding is the next most important, and Helicobacter pylori infection is the third most important. And in terms of other childhood exposures, what increases the risk for ulcerative colitis is urban living environment. So the bottom line about inflammatory breast disease and breastfeeding is that there are several factors that seem to play a role in the development of inflammatory bowel disease and that childhood exposures are incredibly important um, in terms of increasing or decreasing that risk. And breastfeeding seems to be one of the most important factors in reducing the risk of inflammatory bowel disease. What's interesting is that the other very important risk factor for increasing the risk is taking antibiotics under one year of age, and breastfeeding in itself also reduces the risk of taking antibiotics in that first year. So for families who have a history of inflammatory bowel disease, it's important, knowing that there's a genetic risk, that they be counseled, counseled that breastfeeding the infant is actually one of the first most important protective risks. So this is the end of the February 2018 Breastfeeding Medicine podcast. If you like this, please join us at our Facebook page and like us. If you have any questions or you have some ideas for future podcasts, please send me a message through our Facebook page or through our website, themilkmob.org. And again, remember that you can view this in slide format at our Milk Mob channel on YouTube. Talk to you next month. For questions regarding this podcast, contact us through themilkmob.org. We have other educational projects going on there, such as the Clinical Question of the Week and our Outpatient Breastfeeding Champion programs. If you want to see what we look like, check out our Facebook page, where you can also share comments and questions with your co-listeners. To learn more about the Academy of Breastfeeding Medicine, please visit www.bfmed.org. Thanks for listening. We'll be back with you in a few weeks.